that special button on Zoom called Turn On Original Sound. My bad! Okay, uh, we're going to try this again. To, happens to me all the time. We're going to try this again, guys. Yeah. That's good. It, she did that for me. I needed to make sure we were recording. So thanks, Samariah. Take two. Ah, ah. Gotcha. sort of the same. Piano sounds kind of mezzo forte and forte sounds kind of mezzo forte. But if we really exaggerate our dynamics, we can still make them obvious even over the internet. And the interesting thing about that, you can say, well, what's, you know, why are we trying to make things work on the internet? That's so artificial. Eventually we're going to go back to being in person. We're going to be on stage. But actually, when you're performing on stage in front of a live audience, the person in the 20th row also needs your dynamics to be exaggerated. And it's no different than playing on Zoom. So uh, making really soft and exciting pianos and really loud and bombastic fortes, um, just making everything extra is really, really important for performance. It's like the difference between giving a speech and just talking to your buddy who's sitting next to you. So we have to have that kind of you know actor sort of flair. But before we get to that, let's just work on one spot. Your intonation was overall quite good, but I'd like to look at this spot with the high twos and the low twos in the second to last line where it's mezzo forte. So you have high two, then low two, low two, high two. Actually, I take it back. It happens twice and it starts kind of in the middle of the third to last line. You see where that is, where it starts mezzo forte? Da, 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 da. So if you could do that for me, just kind of slowly like you might do it if you were practicing all by yourself and we weren't listening to you. slowly. 
bubbly seem like to you. If you're not annoyed, it's not snow enough, basically. Seconds. Can you repeat? Oh, no. Okay. Two yep. notes. <laughs> no problem. Six notes. It's the second bar of the mezzo forte. <laughs> just play that. One. Just play that one single bar. Just those six notes. note names for me please I forgot what the notes were oh yeah so start on the second bar of the mezzo forte and give me one measure do you have the music in front of you I do no I do okay okay perfect <laughs> to get from good to great 
is where all the work has to come in. And you think, oh, my piece is already so good. What do you mean I have to work harder now? But you know, in order to bring it to that, to as, you know, to maximize your potential, that's what you have to do. So, how are you going to get that measure from really slow and really good back up to speed? So there are a couple of ways to do it. Obviously, you can play it slower, faster, faster, use rhythms. But I like to do add a note. So let's do it kind of close to tempo. Just give me those two notes. teach your reflexes where it is. Right, because the note doesn't count in tune unless you land on it. 
do it really quickly. Still doesn't count. Okay, now that you know where those three notes are, now play them in the other order. describe it but it's like jumpy and very happy in a way yeah if you had a had to, if it was like a movie scene like you had a picture in your head what do you think might be happening or how would how would you describe this like if i was to describe it in the movie or something yeah this is like the happy ending or whatever like i know it's in the beginning of the piece but this is like the the happy ending, like if we're talking about towards the end or something, like it's the happy ending, like, oh my God, everybody's happy. <laughs> All right. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, so what, I, I totally agree with you. Like a final scene and everything's been resolved, no more angst, everything's, you know, just joy. Um, it is piano. So it has to somehow be happy, but not extrovertedly so, right? It's like this little tiny cute, um, so, sorry, wrong notes. So, um, maybe a little bit cute, um, a little bit like, um, like you have a little secret or just something that it has to have all that energy. Because it's not, sometimes when we see piano, we get very calm or slower. Uh, but this is allegro and with this exciting rhythm. Da, 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 da. So we have to be really soft but really full of energy. Like you're about to, like, oh, I've got a surprise for someone. I can't wait to tell them about it. And then the forte comes, okay, here you go. Here's what's happening. All right, so can you give me that piano really soft but really exciting? I will surely try. softer? 
by the way, just for everybody listening, I love what you just did. You actually played too soft, and that's not a mistake. That's part of the process. Whenever we're trying to do something, it's sometimes good to exaggerate it and see where our boundary is. And sometimes we discover that actually that is the right thing, and that if we had guessed where our boundary was and not found it, we would have never gone far enough. But now you did something that I would call pianissimo, which is awesome, that you can control that. So now just bring it one notch back so that it's piano still a little bit more present, but still tiny. and then you can kind of 
once you're used to it, you know, bring it back to a good artistic place. Um, but just to make sure, because it's so easy for, me for piano to turn into mezzo piano and forte to turn into mezzo forte, and everything sounds sort of muddled together. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I you're guess welcome. it's time for, let me see here, Richie playing Polo Etude. Is that right? Yes. All right. Double stop time. Now, is this your first double stop book, or did you already do the Josephine Trot? Uh, this is my first. Okay, excellent.
notes here and there, not perfectly in tune. We can do a little bit of that in a minute. But actually, um, the thing I really want you to focus on is the sound between the notes, which has to do with finger coordination. When a finger goes down, when a finger lifts up. Um, and it's mostly happening between the bow changes. So I say this is like cleaning your bathroom tiles. If you make each of your tiles perfectly sparkling clean, but you forget to clean the grout in between the tiles. You know what I'm talking about? That stuff that goes around each tile. All right? So that's what we've got. We've got some moldy grout here. So um, one of the things you can do, because somehow doing a bow change, we think we're hiding stuff even though we really aren't. So I want you to, this is going to be a little bit of a brain twister, but I always like to rearrange the slurs for double stuff etudes. So let's do it inside out. So we're going to change our bows on beats two and beat four. So what that looks like is... to take a pencil and write it in. Um, so don't be bashful about doing that if you want to do that for a few bars. So the first, so I'm changing bows on the second beat already, right? Yep, so one, two, three, and four, and one, two, three, and four, and one, like that. And wait, 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 you can still start at the frog. Okay. Okay, great. That's excellent. So every time you find a culprit, just stick on that spot. Work it a little. Yeah. 
your, your perfect fourth, your first finger on the G needs to be a little bit lower. Downs and ups, just do whatever. Okay. Doesn't matter. Okay, so here your three is going to have to hop, but it has to hop at the exact right moment. So it sounds as clean as possible. Okay, 
so that was good practice and actually excellent intonation with a C natural, but there's a C sharp in the beginning of the bar and it's still a C sharp all the way through the bar. So in fact, the correct notes are which is actually easier. Oh, what? Okay. going on. I mean, I could have like that fifth for the second finger, right? Hey, that is right. You, you can do that. That is a good spot for that. Okay. One point to you. supposed to be, 
now go back to the note before so they can start the note in that spot. So um, your sixth note uh, was the one that you had fixed. So now go back to the third, sorry your, sorry, your fourth note. So now go back to your third note and see if you can play a good third note followed by a good fourth note. because that C can't be changing pitch in the middle of the bar, all right? So only the other notes in the pair can adjust, which is different than how we normally tune double stops. Now we only have one, you know, we have one that has to stay where it is, and the other has to find it, okay? So give me that bar one more time from the start. Separate bows. Okay, sorry, one sec. I 
think I may have been sent the wrong thing. I'm going to just very quickly go to my Google Drive once more. Do you have that, Quentin? I have Jolene, we'll part A2 number 12. Oh, how strange. I don't know what this other thing is. Oh, maybe that's the end of, okay, pardon me. I see what happened. Okay, now we've got this whole part. All right. Okay, go ahead, please.
Okay, you have to squish around a little for that four. Do it one more time and make sure that your hand is in place that your four can just go plop without having to do anything extra. Okay, your one was a little bit sharp. Just make sure you're leaning your finger down a tiny bit. Okay, that was excellent. Now, take your fingers off of, ah, not like that. Hold on. Okay, play it again. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to take your fingers off, but keep your hand exactly where it just was without moving your hand. They're now hovering over low one and low two, but you're still in first position. And I'll play one, two, three, low four. Right, so a little bit lower on your low one. Okay, you're, I wasn't convinced about your two. Just really listen. Okay, they're all in tune to each other. I'm not sure they're in tune to your string. Can you play that three chorded with the open string? This is a C octave. Let's just start at the beginning. 
So keep your hand in true first position, lean your low one and your low two backwards so that your three can be square on and not reaching, and then listen to every three to make sure that each of them has that beautiful bell sound. Okay, I'm still 
Well, don't start. At, yeah, start where you're going to start. Middle of the bow or whatever. Or, and then stop on the string. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, now go on, uh, stop. No, just stop. Play and stop. Play and stop. Play and stop. Okay, don't, yeah, don't stop there. Play, play, play. Play, play, play. Up, down. Oh, yeah, not quite. Okay, sorry, I don't have a um, C string in my hands, but I'll just play it. Let's. Oh, you know what? I'll play it knocked it up. So basically, every time you get to the tip, or what should be the tip, you're going to stop. down in 
second time. Okay, now play all of bars three and four. Tom, accidentally touching another string. So find every time that there is a string cross and just check it, check it, check it. And if there are any that aren't quite great, use a highlighter and mark them in. So the next day you can just practice them first. Just go through and do that bar, do that bar, do that bar, do that bar. Just kind of random bars where there are tricky string crosses before you start to play the piece down. In other words, the job of finding them, you only have to do it once. And then mark the ones that weren't perfect already. By the way, if some, if you, know, you should play each thing once, see if it's good or not. But um, possibly, um, you, there, there are occasions when something goes perfectly and then it's like just a fluke. So when something goes perfectly, I always like to play it a second time to see if it's really actually secure or whether that was just a weird accident that it went well. And so if you can do it two times good, that means it's good and you don't have to practice it extra. Um, but of course, if something doesn't go well the first time, then that means you definitely have to practice it. Um, but always check everything more than once. All right, does that all make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, wonderful. And now we are on to Polish dance, played by Madison. Hello. Hello. Thank you. 
Thank you. So, do you ever record yourself and listen back in your own personal practice sessions? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And what's, what do you do when you're listening back? Like, what's your... Um, I'm, like, I listen to, I normally, I see, like, the difference of what I hear when I'm playing and the difference when on the recording. Because I notice when I'm recording, I sound very re aggressive very like heavy and then while I'm playing I'm like oh I'm so light and dainty when it's not actually <laughs> light and dainty <laughs> oh there's nothing wrong with being loud and aggressive yeah so, <laughs> anyway yeah that, that is a really interesting point that our perception um first of all our perception of what's coming out emotionally can be quite different because um, you know, there's adrenaline and stuff like that going on, um, and so, um, yeah, and, it's, and sometimes in terms of the, how we're coming across, it's useful even to yeah. watching ourselves, not just listening. I mean, when I was a, a kid growing up learning violin, you know, we just had a little cassette deck. There was no such thing as, you know, watching yourself back on a video, um, so it was audio only, but, you know, definitely the visual impact. Because yeah, a lot of times it can be the opposite. Somebody feels like I'm playing so expressively, and you watch yourself, and it's like deadly dull. Yeah. And so you can like see as well as hear. Um, it's important to also not be so distracted by the visual, because sometimes somebody can flail around and still sound dull, right? Um, you, know, you close your eyes, and you're like, there's not much expression happening, but they're sure swaying a lot. Um, so yeah, but I think both together for that element is definitely useful. Um, 
Yeah, I always, when I'm listening back, I like to choose a purpose. So I might be listening for tone. Like, did I hear any little scratches? Did I hear any little scrunches? Did I hear any fuzziness in my tone, et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so that might be one thing. If I'm listening for tone, I'm going to kind of ignore phrasing, ignore um, maybe even like intonation vibrato. I mean, vibrato is part of tone, but if I'm going to listen for vibrato, I'm going to listen specifically for vibrato as a separate thing. So I might hear a note where the vibrato was too fast and it needed to be more relaxed, or a note that needed more intensity and my vibrato was kind of low-key, or a note that was accidentally dead and didn't have vibrato when it should have. Yeah. Um, so, you know, listening just for vibrato can be another element of listening. Listening for intonation should definitely be its own thing. Because if you're listening for effectiveness of character, and you're listening for vibrato, and you're listening for tone, and you're listening for intonation, you're going to miss a lot of intonation. Intonation yeah. should be its own thing. And as you're listening, just take a separate copy of your music and some kind of a color, and just mark every note that was out of tune. Um, and then go back and kind of drill them. And there was, like, this piece, of course, has sections, the outer sections that, you know, repeat themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when you returned, to the opening material. Um, there were a couple notes that had been out of tune the first time that were in tune the second time. Yeah. But that obviously still means they're not quite secure. Mm -hmm. um, and it's good to have those situations where you can be a little bit, um, I, I don't like to use the word nervous, you know, because that's so negative. But you might be a little excited. Um, yeah. yeah, so if you can like do a fake performance where you sort of visualize, you know, like stand in your kitchen and then walk out to your living room and pretend there are people sitting on the couch and bow and introduce yourself and play your piece from beginning to end as if it's a performance. You can you can spark a little bit of that. Better yet, if you've got a live human, even just one, it, it can even yeah. help you go further. Um, these days, actually, you know, I used to be like, oh, if a friend comes over, you can, you know, recruit them to be your audience for five minutes and get a playthrough under your belt. Um, these days, you can put them on FaceTime, actually. They don't even have to come over. Um, so yeah, get, get a device, put a friend on it, and hopefully you have a second device to then record yourself, otherwise it's, what's the point? Um, but if you can do that with a virtual friend, that could probably work too. Um, anyways, the point is, you know, to get that, that feeling of a little bit of edginess going, play it through, like, and we've got a recording of just now, so, you know, watch it a few, a few times, and... Mm -hmm. Watch it for different things, and don't be distracted by the things that aren't the thing you're watching it for. So we okay. be like, oh, I need to remember about that that bow circle that was a little crashy. No, you don't. You're not thinking about that right now. Don't get distracted. Um, and then, you know, if you are listening for, you know, if, like, let's say bow distribution, um, if you're trying to make sure you're in the right part of the bow with the right kind of spiccatos and things like that, and you hear an out of tune note, ignore it. Um, so you have to kind of discipline yourself as much of what you are listening for as, as well as what you aren't going to let yourself listen for yeah. so that you can give your 100% attention to just that thing you're listening for. So yeah. there were just, in, you know, what's kind of like maddening is that the better your intonation is, the better it has to be. Mm -hmm. In other words, like if you were just kind of a little out of tune all over the piece, then it would just be like, okay, you're at that not quite in tune level. But if you're really, really in tune, except for a few notes, then those notes are going to stick out. Yeah. All right? So the more in tune you are, the more the out of tune notes catch our attention, mm -hmm. which means the better you get, the better you have to get beyond that, which yeah. is like sort of annoying when you think about it, but it's also really a happy thing to be mm -hmm. at that place and like know you can even go further. Yeah. So yeah, so to find those notes now, if I was giving you an, like an actual lesson, then I would have had a copy of your music and I would have just circled them as you were playing and then you would have a whole thing with every single other tune note. But you can do that yourself. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt that you can do that yourself. And then what do you do with it once you have all those notes circled? And it's not that many, but you, know, you can hear there's actually some really obvious ones here and there. Then yeah. you just have to take you know, a few notes before it, like a little cell, and just drill, drill, drill until and you know, and remembering to do it like if you haven't, if you aren't annoyed by the boringness and whatever of practicing a spot, that probably means you haven't done it enough. So, 
And, and even I will be sometimes tempted to like, uh, miss it, miss it, miss it, nail it, oh good. And then I go on to the next measure and my husband yells from the other room, hey, you only did that good once, do it some more times. So there's the same practice, not practice till you get it right, it's mm -hmm. practice after you get it right. Once you've gotten it right, then you have to practice it a bunch so that yeah. you solidify it into your reflexes. Yeah. Um, so, and people can get confused, like, okay, I did it 10 times in a row, good. Yeah, but you did it 15 times out of tune before that, so the out of tune ones are still winning. Yeah. So, um, so you have to have, you know, it can be depressing, oh my gosh, missed it number 18. Um, but, you know, to have some sense of how many times it wasn't in tune, so that you can have more than that that are in tune. And, of course, to make sure that you do a critical number in a row. Because I'll have people who are like, okay, out of tune, in tune, out of tune, in tune, in tune, out of tune, out of tune, in tune, in tune, in tune, out of tune, in tune, out of tune, in tune, in tune. Okay, the in tune ones are slightly ahead, I'm good. Well, with that kind of a sequence, your body's just confused. So you want to make sure that you get to the point where you can do it over and over again in tune lots of times in a row. And then you know that it's more... Um, you know, kind of programmed in to your autonomic nervous system, right? Because this is the part of your body that you can't control in the middle of performance. It either has the habit or it doesn't. And whatever's going to happen is going to happen. So you have to program it in. And also, don't be discouraged if you get it really, really good on day one, and then you start your practice on day two, and it's not where you left it. Like, that's actually normal. It's very rare that you'll actually start from where you left it. So I like to think of it as a range. Like you start here and you end here. Now as long as you don't start all the way back to here, that means you did good practicing. Now where you start day two could be anywhere in between. It might be here, it might be here, it might be here. It's probably not going to be here. And if you practice well, it won't be here. It'll be somewhere in between. So it's like start here, end here, next day. Start here, end here. Next day, start here, end here. Next day, start here. So you see it took till day four to start where I left it off on day one, but that's how progress happens. Yeah. All right, just so you don't get discouraged. You probably already know that, but it never hurts to hear it again. Yeah. yeah. All right, so, um, yeah, so I don't want to be like, oh, all Rachel talked about the entire class was intonation. Um, but I think you can do some of that yourself by listening yeah. back to yourself. So not, so we hear differently, as you, as you mentioned, we hear differently emotionally, but we also hear differently in terms of the technique that we hear yeah. when we're listening without executing because we're not being distracted by doing it. Um, so it's like being our own teacher, actually. Mm -hmm. um, we get a free lesson from ourselves. Okay, let's go to the da -da 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 this middle section. There are a couple of things I want to talk about that. Okay, we've got a really, really nice vibrato. So let's slow it down, see if you can put that vibrato on these first two quarters. You do that, get it going. Still give them some wiggle. Right, so vibrato is like its own separate thing. It, it doesn't always do what would be logical. We could be feeling really emotional and our left hand doesn't do what it needs to do to support that. So we have to have to do conscious vibrato. The good news is that after a certain number of lifetime practice hours, you will start to have subconscious habits with your vibrato. Like I can think anticipation and my vibrato gets narrow and fast and I don't have to think narrow and fast vibrato please like mm -hmm. I did for all those other years. Um, I still check in with it but I don't have to do every little, you know it's like driving with an automatic um, car instead of an, uh, you know with a, a manual gear shift instead of an automatic car. I don't mm -hmm. even know what that means anymore. <laughs> so first, yeah, so da, da, da. so think about every note that you would want to have vibrated and make sure it actually is getting vibrated. Yeah. 
Most definitely. All right, let's try that again. Okay. And I would say in this section, anything a quarter note or longer. So eighth, eighth, quarter, eighth, eighth, half note dotted. So that quarter in the middle of the eighth still has to get some juice. Yes. Okay, now that was a gorgeous vibrato, but it was an eighth note. And you don't really have time to vibrate. That it slowed you down and, and warped to the rhythm. So actually, don't vibrate that note because then it messes things up. And wait, we have, we 
We have rest. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, yeah, that's So rest, we think of them as emptiness, as nothingness, but they're actually part of the music. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they even need to be interpreted. Like if there's a long rest after one phrase before the next phrase, is that rest a continuation of the end of the first phrase? Or are, is it a pregnant pause before the beginning of the next mm -hmm. phrase? Like to which phrase does the silence belong? There's so much we can do with rests. But you can see how da 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 has a very different feeling than da 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 Gives yeah. it so much more character to have that little yeah. rep. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say first, congrats to everyone. Um, great job. And I just want to, again, acknowledge Richie and Madison. I think Richie played Minuet One the last time you heard him. And Madison played long, long ago. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, so you know, that's the other thing about recording ourselves. Usually we record ourselves and listen back right in that moment as a practice tool. But I think there's also something really powerful about recording yourself as a time capsule and not listening back. Because when we're listening with this degree of detail, sometimes our, our standard rises faster than our playing. 
and we actually have this impression that we're getting worse, and it's just that our ear is getting better, which is a very good thing, but then we don't have a realistic sense of where we are, because now we're noticing more stuff. So we might think, oh, I'm not getting any better, or oh, it's just getting worse and worse, and if you listen back to that time capsule of your piece that you recorded three weeks ago, then you're, you'll be like, oh my god, is that what I sounded like? Well, I really have improved. So that can also be something that can give you a lot of encouragement. Um, but that's exciting that you guys have been working so hard and come so far. That's wonderful. Yeah, and, and I just, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, that's, that's a really brilliant perspective. Thank you for sharing that. I think I'll, I'll kind of kick off the questions. Um, is can you give some advice? We do record ourselves in, in the studio, um, some more than others. I wish that we all did it more often, but, um, but we do um, record ourselves. Can you give us some, um, some uh, pointers on recording, how to listen or um, even techniques with how to record oneself. Um, Ooh, my you... husband is yeah. the camera and microphone guy. I'm like the one artist who hasn't had to learn how to do my own setup because he doesn't. No, no, no. no. I, I'm talking about technique as far as like recording in chunks or oh. um, th those sorts of things as, as far as like practice technique, excuse me, practice okay. technique <laughs> when recording. We record like scales, etudes, arpeggios. We're doing a lot of Shradiac in the studio right now. Um, and so, we're, you know, we're recording that stuff, Shradiac, Sevchak, um, but a lot of Shradiac. But can you talk or give at least some pointers on re um, recording techniques and practice techniques when recording one? Yeah, well, one thing that um, I always, um, notice myself is whether I'm listening to myself or listening to the performance of another artist to get ideas and inspiration, I really can't mix and match the micro and the macro. Um, so if I'm listening for an overall impression, what tempos are they doing, what kind of character affects are they doing, I can't be doing that and also thinking, okay, um, which shifts did they choose or things like that. And when it comes to myself, um, you know, we're talking, I guess, non-repertoire, just basics. Um, even that, you know, has a macro and a micro. You know, the macro might be, am I even? You know, do I have a consistent tone? And there you're listening more for an overall impression um, of what's going on. And the micro might be, you know, is every note clean in between each note and the next note? Or is every note in tune? And now you're going to be listening to each note individually and really trying to find those little things. But if you're listening under that much of a microscope to intonation, you might not also be able to see whether there's a steady pulse as the thing is going on. So um, it's really no different from you know what I said before about listen, choosing what you're listening for rather than you know a lot of people will listen without a purpose. Well, let me just hear if I if I notice anything that I need to fix. Um, first of all, don't think of it as fixing. Think of it as improving, because honestly, you can have a perfect performance that can still be improved upon. Perfection is not where we end. In music, but you could think, oh, that's so discouraging. I get it perfect, and I still have to try to fit, try to improve it. But actually, that I think that's the most fun thing in the world that we can never end our journey. You know, in math, two plus two equals four. You've got the right answer. That's it. That's the end of the line. In sports, you know, you start to be on your decline when you're in your late twenties or something. But in music, you can be more meaningful and more interesting year by year, decade by decade, so we can keep striving towards farther and farther heights. Um, but what that means is, you know, I mean, intonation, yes, there is a point of perfection that isn't going to be more perfect than perfect. But, um, you know, the quality of your tone can be irreproachable. No scratches, no fuzz, no slidey sounds, no bow changes that we hear, no angular string crosses. It can be a perfect tone but maybe it could be an even more gorgeous color still yet to come, all right? So, so I don't, even when it's not yet perfect, I don't like to frame it as, what do I need to fix? I always want to think, what do I need to improve? What could be better? 
so that you're thinking of it positive. Like, I've already, I've already gotten this far, but I know that I can still go farther. And that is going to exist for your whole life, even after you're better and better and better. So just, what can I improve? But thinking, but not just listening and hoping that you accidentally notice something that could be improved. But you want to see, okay, what might be able to be improved in the realm of expression, in the realm of sound, in the realm of cleanliness, in the realm of intonation, in the realm of left hand vibrato, in the realm of bow hand technique, articulations, string crosses, bow chains. So listening for these basic things, and it depends on the piece, what the things are that you might listen for, but um, always having those, those goals in mind before you listen. And yes, you can just kind of listen and get an impression and then things come to you. That's, it's not that you should never do that, and you might discover something that you hadn't thought of ahead of time. But if that's all you ever do, you're going to miss a heck of a lot. Um, so directed listening is really the thing. And that's whether you're doing you know, one line of shredding or an entire performance of Polish dance beginning to end. Um, you're going to be doing directed listening. Now you can divide it up. You can do just the first page of Polish dance. Listen to it once, listen to it again, listen to it again. Think of different things, not the whole piece beginning to end. Um, and of course, when you're doing playbacks, you can play back um, bits at a time, you know, just two measures, just one line, just one section. Sometimes page three is going to sound different if you played pages one and two and then page three all in the same playthrough. So you don't only ever want to do sections. Sometimes when you're ready to do so, you definitely want to do those long stretches because things might happen that otherwise wouldn't. But Nothing. Also, you know, don't only wait till you can do the whole thing before you do it at all, you know. And the same thing goes for practice. You know, once we can, you know, like be in person with each other more, you know, doing those in-person concerts, going and playing for a kindergarten, going and playing for a retirement home, people will say, oh, I have nothing to play. But no, you've got to get performances under your belt, get in the habit of performing. You know, the Urtex police are not going to issue you a citation if you play only half your movement. So go and do whatever you've got. Um, so you know, that extends not only to what you're recording and listening back to, but also to what you're sharing with others, actually. All right. Um, let's, do we have any other questions? I have a question, if that's OK. Please. Um, first of all, I'm a, a fan. Thank you for your vision. Um, being part of the generation that is changing basic classical theory. Um, your mindfulness is stunning, and I took many notes. Um, how do you then bring all of that to your performance? How do you, you have, how do you bring your mindfulness when you're Actually, that's a great question. I'm so glad you brought up that topic. The discipline with performing is to set it all aside. I'm going to ignore my string crosses. I'm going to ignore my vibrato. I'm going to ignore my intonation. I'm going to ignore most of the physical, technical elements of playing my instrument when I'm performing for people. Either I've programmed it into my muscles adequately or I haven't but I'm not going to be able to suddenly get it right that one time I'm playing it on stage. So whatever is going to happen is going to happen. The thing I can control is my expression. So am I playing it calm and peaceful and then exciting and then kind of angry and then very sad and lonely and then a little confused and then triumphant? You know, am I telling the story of the piece? that I can think about in the moment of performance and do. And honestly, I would rather hear a piece with a few missed shifts that really had a lot of expression than a piece where somebody was very careful and got most things right and didn't have anything to say about it. It's like, why am I watching somebody play an agent on stage? I came here to hear music. It's not like an Olympic sport. The technique is not the point. That technique is at the service of the artistry. So in the end, this is not Olympic gymnastics, you know, or Olympic figure skating. They purport to be artistic, but really the jump is about the jump. The jump isn't about some larger purpose. 
And for us, it is. Um, in fact, I know I've done technical pieces really well when somebody doesn't compliment me on my technique. Now, is that annoying? Yes, if I'm playing a Paganini Caprice and I nailed all my tenths and all my shifts and all my everything, I would like people to acknowledge my hard work. But if I get off stage and people say, oh my gosh, I just love that, that was so beautiful, the chord changes were so interesting and it had so much character, then I realized that my technique was so good that people didn't even notice it. And that's the whole point of making music, even with a virtuoso piece. So, yeah, so basically, and, and you know, there are, there are limits to that. Obviously, if you're super out of tune, it doesn't matter how expressive you are, you know, it's like having on a beautiful outfit and then there are splotches of mud all over it. It's just going to ruin it. But if there's one little speck of dirt here, one little speck of dirt there, but it's otherwise just the most amazing outfit, then people are still going to notice the outfit, right? So you, you have to also, the, the thing to remember on stage is that we have this phenomenon when we have an adrenaline surge of microscopic ears. We're going to suddenly think that we sound worse than we've ever sounded in our lives yeah, because we're hearing things with this heightened listening. Um, and and it's, it's really ironic, because these are the moments when we should be listening the least, and suddenly we're hearing the best. So we have to remember that we have microscopic ear syndrome and basically not take our impressions seriously. I mean, I can get off stage and be like, oh my god, I just had so much sloppiness and so much bad tone. And then I listened back to a recording, and I was like, that was pretty darn good. I don't, I, what was I even bugging about? So um, we have to just ignore that. And, and frankly, even if you were a bit sloppy, since there's nothing you can do about it, you still have to ignore it. Um, but it's probably not real in the first place. Yeah, and so we just have to think about our expression. And actually, the way to get there, because it's almost like flipping a switch. Like, what we have to do as a good practicer is be searching for things that aren't quite as good as they could be. And always, like, not criticizing ourselves in a negative way, like, oh, that was bad, that was bad, I'm so bad. But saying, okay, this needs improving, this needs improving, this can be better, this can be better. Listening to ourselves with that mindset. On stage, it's almost like, okay, you know, I've dieted, I've used my acne cream, I've been to the salon, this is as good as it's gonna get. I just have to have self-confidence and embrace myself, flaws and all. Be like, I'm going out, it's Saturday night, I look good. And just not think, oh, there's this one area that I still need to tone up. There's this, you know, whatever, whatever, right? So it's that kind of an idea. It's not about egotistical, like, I am the greatest violinist. Um, and you've probably heard people, and you can tell if they're thinking that when they perform for you, and it's a little obnoxious. But you're not being a, a good, humble person by being on stage saying, I'm sorry, this wasn't as good as I wanted to be. I'm sorry, this wasn't as good as I wanted to be. Because then that's almost like doing a disservice to your audience. Your audience doesn't want all of your apologies. Your audience wants you to enjoy what you're doing so that they can enjoy what they're doing because you're there to help them enjoy it. And it's not like, you know, by saying, oh, that shift did, that this shift didn't matter. You're not being a bad person or a bad musician. You're actually being a good performer. Now, if you do that in the practice room, you're being a bad practicer. But, so it's really very opposite, and it can make you feel very discombobulated that what you have to do in the practice room is the opposite of what you have to do on stage. So the way to get used to that is to practice performing, to say, okay, this playthrough, I'm going to pretend I'm on stage and flip the switch, and now I'm going to just not care if I have imperfections, and I'm going to embrace myself and celebrate how good I sound at this moment. And just express myself and, oh, and best of all, have fun. And do that and then say, okay, now I'm going to flip the switch back and now I'm going to fix all the stuff. Um, and then flip the switch again. And, you know, so, to, so that when you're playing, and we, we, we've seen practicers who can go too far in one or the other direction. There are people, you see them in the practice room and they're expressing themselves and they're playing like they're a great artist and they're playing all these sloppy double stops and they don't care because they're a great artist. And it's like, okay. If that's where you're at in the moment of performance, go for it. But you're in the practice room. You need to fix some stuff. Um, but then people who are like, careful, 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 and then they get out on stage and they're like, oh my god, then they haven't adequately prepared. So most of your practice, I'd say probably, you know, maybe a good ratio is 90, 10. Most of your practice is practicing, practicing. Maybe 10% of your practicing is practicing, performing. 
and you have to tell yourself, it might be once a day, an end of the day playthrough, it might be twice a week, it might be you need a couple weeks to learn the piece and then you start doing occasional performances, you can perform just one section, just one phrase, just one page as your piece is getting up and running. You don't have to wait till you know the whole thing. You don't have to wait till it's memorized. But when you're performing, you flip that switch and you um, just practice having this other mindset and getting used to that, really. Other questions? That was great. Thank you so much. Can we okay, give a well, round of applause, please, to Rachel Barr and Pine for coming? Great job, everyone. Okay, well, thank you all for being yeah. here. Thanks so much. And we all have your book. Which one? And we're um, the Black Composers. Oh, we, okay. We were supposed to do, that was actually what this class was going to be. Um, but of course we're not in person, so we can't do all the duos, et cetera. So, but everyone has the book and we will be working on it once we are officially back in person. Awesome, by then you'll have book two as well. Yes, oh fun. good, awesome, cool. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next week. All right, take care everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. You, Thank Bye. you for coming. Thanks, everyone. Crash. <laughs> I'm exhausted. Rachel was like, you look so tired. I was like, I'm exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> well, here, let me stop the recording. Yeah.